Hello, hello, hello. Hi. I'm just getting things set up and then it came when others will be joining very soon. Okay. Hello. Ah. Hello. Jonah. Where do I? Maybe I'm going to share my link. Post on the high school page, uh, post on the college page, group. Cindy. Um, college page. All right, I've shared it on everything. I'm going to message the Discord and we will get started with the intro. I will give hosting um, stuff to you, Kane, so that you can share a screen. Okay. Oof. 
Mm. Oh, cool. So, because like for some reason, open and full screen did everything. I was like, I can't find any of the stuff I had on the screen prior. Yeah, no, that's that. Or talk about, about the whole share screen. Yeah, it's kind of weird. That the way Zoom does it. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm going to start talking and then I'll like to the host and then we'll get started. Perfect. All right. Hi, y'all. Welcome back to another workshop lecture uh, hosted by Debate Boutique. We are always super excited to be uh, doing these as not only for our students, but as a resource for students who are unable to attend programs due to um, any financial or just time constraints or students who uh, were able to attend a program but just want you know, additional fortification by other really um, awesome critical minds uh, and strategy thinkers in the debate community. And so uh, we are not only excited about that, but also another thing that if you are not already, We've been doing quite a few of these live streams now. Make sure to comment, like, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. A lot of work is being put into um, new content for the YouTube page. So a lot of things are coming to the channel. We do not want you to miss it. So definitely, definitely tune on in um, and you know subscribe. Other thing is that start in August, August 15th, uh, so 8, 15, 21, we are going to be launching our fall program services for one-on-one -on -one coaching, for additive services to any uh, coaching that you are receiving, um, and just other things that I can't disclose quite yet because that's the purpose of a launch. So stay tuned for that because it'll be announced not only on Instagram and YouTube, but as well as our website and a newsletter. So if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, go to the website and subscribe so you can be the first to know and get on top of any sneaky little deals um, that kind of pop up for that. Last thing, and of course the most important thing is to introduce the lecture proper that you all are about to receive. And while I talk, Ken, I'm gonna make you the host, um, or, and also add in. Yeah, I'm gonna make you the host. Boom, change host, perfect. Um, and so while Kane is getting set up, I will introduce the lecture. This is going to be the Afro-pessimism one-on-one, the disequilibrium, equilibrium, reimagined equilibrium of Marvel's Falcon and Winter Soldier. I really hope that I said all of that correctly because honestly, I made so many thumbnails and like titles for um, this lecture and I, it was a whole bunch of words. Um, so I'm super excited for the, the applications and using the kind of figurative of Marvel to explain these concepts, which I think is a nice twist to what um, currently exists in teaching. Um, Afro-pessimism, hashtag critical race studies, hashtag critical race theory is essential. So sorry, uh, Al Gore's internet or Beyonce's internet. Uh, this, it continues, this content will continue to happen. Uh, Kane is a debate big brain of the community. So I think of no one greater to um, be leading the discussion, the workshop on Afro-pessimism, not only various accolades uh, in the context of his own um, competitive career debating for the University of Oklahoma and being in uh, very late elims of not only national tournaments, but also coaching um, a lot of really successful uh, college programs, including myself. Um, so I know what it means uh, to benefit from Kane's intellect, strategy, mind, and perspective. And so this is a treat that we are all very blessed to be able to receive. And so without further ado, I think that I'm going to throw the, the mic to you, Kane, and let you lead this. I've been doing this for a whole year and I can never remember to unmute myself when I need to. Yay, online. Um, cool, I was like lucky. I'm a person that does mixed media stuff. So like there'll occasionally be ruffles of papers in between this presentation. 
um, slash low key kind of like a seminar, um, mostly because we're just going to focus on like central themes of this particular school of thought more than we are going to, you know, hash out all of the debate nuances of Afro pessimism. Uh, before we get started, where are folks from? You can either just unmute yourself or post in the chat since this is our first meeting together. I'm from Baltimore. Well, I, for, for, oh, Baltimore I, City I, College too. Yeah, that's uh, our high Baltimore school. and Baltimore City College. We are we are actually quite familiar with each other, um, but it's been a while since we may have seen each other. So, oh, we have a bunch of folks from Baltimore, one person from Central Texas. All right. Um, just as an aside, I also attended Baltimore City College High School, um, class of 2010. Um, so it's good to see y'all involved with the program and good to see that that team is still going strong. And we got a California person here. That's where I'm currently located which is in the Bay Area. All right, so we got that out the way. Let's go ahead and get this open. Zoom is a little bit different to me for me since I use everything by way of Google, but we're gonna get this out. Um, oh, cool. You can actually do individual windows, so that's good. Uh, someone else just entered the room, so I'm gonna let them in. And we'll get started. Also, I have the fan running behind me. So if it's too loud at any point, just let me know and I'll turn it down because it's kind of hot today over on the West Coast. All right. So as Jasmine said, that's the title of our presentation. We will at some point go over these three, or I guess there are two words, this, this particular phrase, equilibrium, disequilibrium, and reimagine equilibrium because it's really integral to how Afro-pessimism and how Frank Wilderson understands what he describes as the narrative arc of the slave, which we'll get into. All right, so by the end of this presentation, scholars will have the ability to articulate a description of what Afro-pessimism is and is not, and understanding of the scholars and intellectuals who influence the development of Afro-pessimism develop a basic understanding of key ideas that animate Afro-pessimism as a theoretical practice and participate in a close reading of, it's said a scene, but we should have time for it, I think at least three, if I do this correctly, um, from Marvel Studios Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I picked this series in particular because I feel like it's useful to also attach some sort of piece of media, piece of culture, to some of the theoretical concepts that we'll be investigating today. In addition to, I was inspired from one of my old debate coaches who, when he was going around doing camp lectures about Nietzsche, often used the film Kung Fu Panda as a way to sort of articulate some of the concepts to folks in your age ranging group. So hopefully this will be helpful as well. If you notice, this objective does not clarify how to answer Afro-pessimism. That is not a thing that will be covered here, right? Um, there are probably places where you could have this lecture in an answer to critiques or just a general structure. I, that could be a whole separate lecture in of in itself. Um, so we're just really going to be focusing on understanding what the argument is more than it is responding to it, which I think is sometimes a rare opportunity that we have in debate since we are in a competitive space where our goal is to analyze a thing in order to learn how to beat it and, you know, sort of be able to handle it for our own um, personal and competitive purposes. So before we come to a rough consensus on what Afro, what is Afro-pessimism, let's start with what it is not. 
it is not a negative understanding of what black people are capable of doing individually or collectively. It is not a woe is me, woe is black people narrative. It seeks to really understand how that particular association becomes created socially, politically, legally, and also at the level of the unconscious. It is not a short-sighted denial of various histories of struggle, resistance, and protest. It does not deny that the Black people have the capacity to do those things or that Black history is not full of those moments. It is not a fatalistic misunderstanding of how power operates in its various applications or expressions. It doesn't try to overdetermine what power is. It doesn't seek to undermine uh, people's ability to respond to power, but gives us a different theoretical lens to understand the ways that those particular sort of assumptions about power sort of become incoherent in the face of Blackness and the experience of those who have been enslaved. It is not some throwback to back, back nationalism, black nationalism and its masculine and Harold Northern's understandings of revolution it is not, you know, men got to grab a gun, you know, we got to pick up the gun, we got to, you know, overthrow the state, the men are going to do it, and then we're going to have some weird 70s black exploitation utopia where we have overthrown the man and the people are liberated. It is not the new form of radical leftist critical race theory. It is not the trying to get God out of schools. It is not trying to, you know, mobilize white people's guilt so that we can all get, you know, 24 inch rims and brand new Hummers. It is something much more than that, but it's definitely in conversation with some of the ideas of critical race theorists like Derek Bell and his entrance convergence theory, which argues that no matter what sort of progressive gains a minority population is given in a society, it is not really for the benefit of those minority communities, more so it is for the stability of the society of those who benefit from the status quo. So that you make marginal gains that oftentimes can be reversible in order to produce the appearance of change and progress. And then finally, which I think is the most important, important point that I think in some way touches all of the, I wanna say two, four, five points that came before it is finally, Afro-pessimism is not a reductive and divisive fixation over slavery that attempts to use the figure of the enslaved as an anachronistic, does anyone know what the word anachronistic means or what it means to have an anachronism? Yes, basically like an idea of overthrowing the government. That's anarchy, not. So this phrase is referring to a thing that is placed out of time. It's a literary term, right? So uh, the best example I have for this is imagine the story that takes place in 1985, but one of the main characters is driving a car that was made in 1993, right? It's, some, it's an item that is out of place in time and it's just not in the right particular order. It's like the simplest way I can describe it. So it just means that we're not using our fixation or our, the process, the history of slavery and just applying that to, you know, all the places all over time in history, just so that we can make an argument. So that's what it means to say that the, that, um, Afro-pessimism is not a reductive and divisive fixation over slavery that attempts to use the figure of the enslaved as an anachronistic element that can be imposed on the controversies and conflicts of post-slavery -slave societies. Is this still showing you all the presentation, by the way? Yes. I, okay, because I just opened my notes and I'm, they, because I do I have a Mac, it just went to a whole different um, window. So I got it. All right, cool. Did everybody get that down? Do y'all need more time to copy this or are we good? Mostly just asking because online things are weird and I teach mostly middle schoolers. So I generally have to pause and give them a second to 
either convert some of the information on the note on their screen into notes as well. Zoom reacts, y'all, that helps. Okay, thumbs up, that's cool. I'll, good job, I, good thing I have multiple displays. It makes this a little bit easier. All right. So let's talk about what Afro-pessimism is. Afro-pessimism is less a school of philosophy or some kind of political identification. Like if you were to go register to vote, you check other and they were like, oh, what is your, what does other mean? You wouldn't type in, I'm an Afro-pessimist. But it's more of a theoretical orientation that centers its intellectual investigations on quote, a poetics and politics of abjection, wherein racial blackness operates as an asymptotic approximation of that which disturbs every claim or formation of identity indifference as such. Um, the word asymptotic refers to asymptotes. So the mathematical term that describes that when a line reaches a particular point, it starts to curve away and up, right? So that just sort of is describing that there's not like sort of a consensus in which racial blackness can meet um, contemporary understandings of identity, difference, agency, um, what we can consider political, etc. And the word abjection is a very particular form of art. Um, fundamentally, it just means the state of being cast off. And it's primarily attributed to the post-structuralist scholar, Julia Kristeva. Um, but for the context of our discussion, I think the more useful understanding of objection comes from the sociologist Imogen Tyler, who uses abjection to describe bodies and things that an individual or community finds repulsive or disgusting. And in order to retain a sense of identity through those things, they are often repressed or ostracized from society, creating the conditions for things like marginalization, social exclusion, and oppression. So I think another good way to describe abjection is like the way in which most societies treat homeless and homeless people, right? They view them as a particular social blight um, in a particular area of space, they literally will reconfigure spaces to make it difficult for people that don't have homes to like lay out on benches, um, establish tents in what are considered public spaces. And they'll also legislate policies to do things like, oh, we're gonna help you find a home. That means we're gonna put you in a temporary shelter. Once that temporary shelter gets full, we will ship you off to a bus and send you out to wherever, wherever we think you came from or a place that we think you can go. And this is actually something that's been documented in the state of California in particular, where they will, they have in the past definitely given um, people that have had not had houses or houseless people or homeless people, however you want to describe that state of being without a home, um, vouchers for things like Greyhound and maybe like a thousand bucks and are like goodbye and good luck. And what often happens is that those people end up finding their way back to where they were sent from still relatively in the same, if not worse condition. The other important thing about um, Julia Kristeva's work and Imogen Tyler's work is that Kristeva also argues that institutions and organizations tend to rely on social rituals and structural practices, structural practices being like the creations of laws and policy in order to sustain this process or state of abjection for a particular group in the society. Additionally, Afro-pessimism argues that the suffering of Black folk across the diaspora is distinct from other forms of suffering that animate other isms. So there's making the argument that the way in which Black people, especially those who were formerly considered African, right, who were then brought onto the slave ships through the Middle Passage into the New World, right, not just like the United States of America, but the Caribbean, Central America, South America, and also there were some points in time in which Britain was also involved in the slave trade as well. So like they, that's why you have a bunch of slaves in the Caribbean, etc. cetera. 
the other thing that's important is that Afro-pessimism works to formulate an account of that suffering that's both it's everyday and it's spectacular instances. So it's not just consumed, Afro-pessimism is not just concerned with the latest police shooting or, you know, the most violent lynching that's happened either within the 20th century or in the 21st century, but it's also really concerned in, in the ways in which those who are not, you know, mobile, those who are not formally and understood as police, formally understood as agents of the state, formally understood as um, instruments of violence can assume those positions publicly. And that will become a little bit more relevant when we briefly talk about Sadia Hartman and her work and how that contributes to the formulation of Afro-pessimist thought. But that idea that both in our everyday instances, our day-to-day -day interactions, and in those spectacular things that we might see with things like George Frey, um, which is a very big example that happened with last year during the pandemic, um, that those two things are two sides of a, the same coin. The reason why it focuses on a formulating an account to this particular type of suffering, it does it to display the standard operating procedure or the rules of anti-Blackness that create the condition for violence that Black folk experience across the world. So like in Africa, Caribbean, Central America, United States, London, where there is a community of folks that we can identify as Black, there is a particular condition of violence that tends to follow them. And that also works to sort of allow the community around those Black folks to have some sense of coherency and understanding. Finally, Afro-pessimism encourages its collaborators and conspirators to rethink the position of those who are formerly enslaved in our present moment. In order to do so, and this is very important, Black Afro-pessimism does not view Blackness as a cultural identity to be authenticated or possessed, but as a position of accumulation or fun and fungibility. Accumulation and fungibility are terms that come from Marxism. Accumulation just literally means the acquisition of goods. The more that you accumulate, it means the more that you have gathered of a particular thing. So people like to accumulate capital or accumulate money in order to build their wealth. And this other concept, which is called fungibility, and fungibility just means the ability for a commodity or object to be used in exchange without restraint. So like, for example, this piece of paper that I have in my hand is very fungible because I can do what I want with it. I can fold it into whatever shape I want it to. I can put it on top of my camera, block my screen. I can tear a piece off, right? No zero consequence to me. I already wrote on this paper, it's done. Tear another piece off. And what I can ultimately do is I can destroy that thing, right? It has. It is completely subject to my will and my desire as a result of being a fungible object. This is important because not just objects are fungible, what we learn from chattel slavery and particularly antebellum slavery is that that, that sort of position of accumulation and fungibility can be extended onto sentient beings, people, animals, et cetera. And that becomes a condition that really um, shapes a lot of the philosophical, legal, cultural and social relationships that develop in the wake of chattel, chattel slavery. And this is a quote from Wilderson's first book, Red, White and Black. And the first one is a quote from Jarrett Sexton's paper, Afro-Pessimism, the Unclear Word. Anyone? need more time to look over the slides, ask a quick question before we transition to the next part of this presentation, which is more just like, here's the, here are some of the hoo-hoo of Afro-pessimism. Got, we got the pineapple pizza neon. I'm, I was probably never going to forget your name because like that image is just going to haunt me. 
for the rest of my summer, but I do appreciate the commitment to such an absurdity. All right, so, oh, another person just joined. Okay. And oh, I thought there was, I thought we were moving on to the next slide, so that's good. Afro pessimists are just theorists who believe that Black folks and those who are rendered Black are sentient beings and that they have thoughts, feelings, sense of self, community, et cetera. But those things are generally disavowed and dismissed by the world through anti Blackness. Right. And that idea that there are Black folks and those who are rendered Black are important because there was also a sort of saying that I remember um, of the, I had the opportunity to actually meet Jared Sexton at another debate camp called The Loom back in 2013 um, due to the work of Rashad Evans, uh, Amber Kelsey, and Nicholas Brady, who I'm really grateful for having that opportunity to like learn about this scholarship and also improve some of the things, some of my skills at debate at the same time. Um, he said that Black people, I believe, have an underprivileged yet non-exclusive relationship to Blackness, which means that Black people and those of the African diaspora are generally like the prototypes for a lot of the violent technologies that are become extended to other groups of people, other communities, other human beings that exist in the world. So that means that if that's true, Afro-pessimism is not really just for or about Black people, but it is about that sort of question of relationality between those who are rendered Black and those who are historically tied to slavery and those who are not Black. All right, so who are considered Afro-pessimists? I put considering quotes because like I said, Afro-pessimism is not some sort of identity, identitarian checkbox, but literally a theoretical and analytical lens for describing how certain people interact and beings interact in the world. So who we have on the left is Frank Wilderson, who is some would, I guess, argue the primary architect and like what people that refer to when you talk about Afro-pessimism. He is an American writer, dramatist, so that's just someone that works on the different various aspects of the plays, both the thematic and performative elements, as well as like the critical elements of a play. Filmmaker, critic, he also was involved as a, and he was participating in anti-apartheid struggles in South Africa during the height of apartheid. He was kind of like an espionage agent. He like got intel on Americans that came to, into South Africa, right, to make sure they were if they were part of the CIA or if they were actually like down with the cause of the movement. And so a lot of his experiences, both like personally and intellectually, go into forming this um, frame of thought. And as you can see, I just put a list of works. Uh, Graham She's Back and Marx is one of the big foundational pieces of his scholarship where he's taking the task the Italian scholar Antonio Gramsci and a bunch of people like to use Gramsci's work to describe how various types of political resistances can happen in a given social space, right? Don't have a lot of time to talk about the nuances of Gramsci and thought, but just like as a, you know, cliff notes explanation as to what's being engaged in that essay. Then you have the memoir Incognito, which is about primarily his time as growing up in Minnesota, his time in South Africa, where he was doing a lot of that sort of um, revolutionary work. Then you have Red, White, and Black, which is more, I think, a PhD, PhD dissertation that was turned into a full text and published by Duke University. This is where he sort of outlines the theory that crafts the experiences and how he interpret those experiences in Incognito. And Afro-Pessimism, which is his most recent book, which is interesting because it's considered a work of creative nonfiction because it's part memoir, part theory, part film analysis and literary analysis as well. But it's not as, in my mind, dense as Red, White, and Black, 
And I think it's a much easier and approachable read um, if you're getting into Wilkinson's work. So if you had to like pick a guide for how to, how to read these texts, I would read Incognito first, then I would read Afro-Pessimism second, then maybe Gramsci's Black Marx as sort of like an extended introduction, and then finally go to Red, White, and Black. Do on the right, like computer space and weird to me, is Jarrett Sexton, uh, also teaches at UC Irvine, where Frank Wilson was until very recently due to <laughs> personal stuff. And he wrote the book Amalgamation Schemes, which really talks a lot about this idea of miscegenation, how that the idea of race mixing, how that was a real big anxiety and how those anxieties are in some way formulated by anti-Blackness and operate on what he describes using the work of John Francis Leotard as the libidinal cotton. Which is just sort of like, if you wanna think of, and I, this is a thing that I'll pause and describe real quick since I got to it. You should just think of the libidinal economy the way, is the way in which desire, feelings, sentiments, and affect are organized in a given social uh, space because it is libidinal and it's referencing the libido or the unconscious as psychoanalysis understands it. It is not like a material economy, but it's a way of analyzing how people react to the presence of black people, the way in which black people or blackness attempts to enunciate or articulate its suffering in the world and the political and theoretical conclusions that come from such a relationship. These are two other scholars who are important in the contribution and understanding of Afro-pessimism, um, Patrice D. Douglas and some of it D. Terefe, I really hope I said her last name right, because I really do appreciate her work and I'm like really excited to get into it because I saw uh, some of it speak a couple of times over the past year and some of the things that she was really talking about the unconscious, its relationship to blackness and particularly black women and how we can formulate those things was really interesting to me. So I'm gonna definitely take the time to look at her work now that this presentation inspired me to do some of this mini bibliography to help y'all have a deeper understanding of afro pessim as well. Person on the left is Patrice D. Douglas. Um, she co-authored this paper with Wilderson titled The Violence of Presence, Metaphysics in the Black and World. Been a very long time since I've read that essay because that was something I read like 2013 was like my peak debate time. So that was like the last time I really held that material, right? And that's something I encourage y'all to visit once you've done that sort of initial reading of Frank's work to sort of help contextualize maybe some of the other things that you might have been reading in works like Afro Pessimism, the book, not the theory. The a thing that I do want to talk about is this phrase corner tripping, which comes from Hortense Spillers, who we'll get to at pretty sure in like the next few slides. Um, and pornotroping just means the parading of the suffering of the black body as a stimulant and satisfaction for a possibly white or black readerly voyalistic gaze. The easiest sort of epic understanding of pornotropes is if you read old abolitionist advocacies for why we should get rid of slavery. So things like Uncle Tom's Cabin, where you know Uncle Tom is just that, even that figure of an Uncle Tom, the black or the slave who is always willing to sort of put himself before the master, who will always even put his own body, his own flesh, his own pain in order to maintain the sort of status quo of the pastoral plantation or sort of like, you know, where life is going on the plantation, like we might have to be beaten, we might get worked to death, you know, we might not be able to have families, we may not be able to actually choose to do what we want with our time, even the time that we have off, the moments of brief enjoyment and entertainment that we have as a community 
is also dictated by the person that owns me, right? But that's all good and fine because at the end of that narrative, Uncle Tom dies. And so as the reason why that's such a disgusting trope and this in the eyes of Afro pessimists is like, wow, this person literally had to go to the absolute zero point of their suffering. And that's what is really what un makes slavery unjustifiable. Just like that, there's like, it's supposed to be melodramatic. You're supposed to be like really heartbroken by the end of Uncle Tom's cabin, right? In order for you to identify with the idea of like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have people enslaved and like forced to breed and like whipped and like torn apart. Like instead of just going, taking that on face value, you need to see that condition at its absolute worst in order for it to make sense to you as like a, uh, idea that's worth considering. All right, so now we're gonna get into the influences for Afro-pessimism. This dude right here is a really big influence. This is Franz Fanon, he was a Martinetian writer, which means he came from the Caribbean island of Martinique, which is, and, which is a French colony. He was a writer, revolutionary, because he was also in Algeria at the time of the Algerian War, where Algeria was declaring its independence from France, which was really an extended bloody and intense campaign by the French to try to keep that colony. And finally, he was a psychoanalysis. He was actually, trained by one of the pupils of another famous psychoanalysis, um, Jacques Lacan. He was trained by Jacques Lacan's pupil, John Ory, um, which is a very weird overlap because, can you, I'll answer that. We have a dedicated and a question and answer period, Neon, so I'll answer that there. And I think that's also a good thing to do is that if you have questions during this presentation, definitely type them in the chat and we can get to them before we do our close reading of the Marvel Studios series. So, yeah, he was a psychoanalysis trained by John Ory, who was also trained by Jacques Lacan. I'm probably butchering up these French names. Sorry, Miss Monica. Um, but he also his work mostly focused on the pathologies or sort of the diseases that come about from being like really stressed out about colonialism and the slight neuroses that are producing that condition as well. So he's like really concerned with like how does colonialism impact the mental and social, mental and psychic well being of those who colonizes and what effect does that have on the psyche, interests, and desires of the colonizers as well. So two really important concepts that get ported from France and non into Afro-pessimism is this concept of negrophobia and negrophilia. Uh, phobia denotes an extreme or irrational fear or an aversion to something. So negrophobia would just be the extreme and irrational fear of blackness and black people. Negrophilia is the opposite, which is denoting a fondness, especially an abnormal love for a thing which is a thing that you can probably see culturally. There are a lot of contemporary conversations in which this happens, in which it's like, oh, um, we will criminalize natural and black hairstyles, but as soon as a Kylie Jenner, Kim Kardashian, or some other influencer wants to put on box sprays, big, and big enough to change their body, change their facial features in some way to reflect what, reflect what those would consider black, it's all of a sudden okay. Or I think the more contemporary thing that's been happening is the uh, is anyone familiar with the Black dancer strike on TikTok? Like, I'm not a big TikTok person, but that's just sort of the thing that's happening. So, Skylar, would you like to talk about that or sort of explain that to folks, even if they know? I know this is live stream, so maybe we can also, you know, talk to the people who might not might be here but also aren't here, I guess. Yeah. Um, black TikTok creators weren't getting a lot of credit for the dances that they created that became that made songs more popular. So they decided to go on strike to show how much they influenced the dances in the songs on TikTok. Right, because people love those dances, right? Like, and I think it was a really indicative the sort of commentary where people tried to, especially you know, non-black people and white people tried to make their own dances, and they're like, "Oh, this is bad. This is really, you know." 
felt off kilt, but the the tension in that shows that there could be a lot of love for black people, love for black people, black culture, black products, but at the same time, no actual support for those communities in a way that actually represents that, you know, attachment, which is why Negrophilia is in some ways abnormal, because it's like it's a love that's only self-serving to the person that is that feels it, not to the person that's supposed to be receiving that love. Another concept that's important from Fanon that gets ported into Afro-pessimism is this concept of sociogeny, right? This is where Fanon attempts to build the, on the work of previous psychoanalysis like Sigmund Freud to articulate how socially produced phenomena such as poverty or crime are linked to certain population groups as if those groups are biologically or ontogenetically predisposed for those particular actions or events. So if you've ever had a debate or seen a debate in somebody's YouTube comments, Instagram, social media comments, where they're talking about race issues in America, there's always gonna be that one person that's like, why do, how do black people take up 13% of the population and do 60% of the crime? It must mean that they are, you know, they, crime is what they're built to do. Like they are born criminals, right? So what Fanon says is that those linkages are ultimately produced by the sentiments, feelings, expectations, and so on that are developed in colonial situations, right? There you go. Oh, where's the other piece? So, like, the way that you can also think about it is that there are certain types of individual sort of perceptions or prejudices that can be reflected in how people talk about and describe the societies that they live in. And those in turn inform those values as a result. This concept, and I think this concept is something that really spoke to me when reading Fanon, which was, uh, just trying to keep an eye on time here. Violence is a constitutive element of the world and it's fundamental to the creation and maintenance of the world. Like we like to think that, you know, we just came into a world, things happen, conflicts happen, you know, those begin, those end. But Fanon's point is that in order for us to even like conceptualize the world that we live in now and the advancements of things like capitalism, colonialism, it requires us to really forget and sort of table all the violence that produced those situations. Like the United States would not exist without the genocidal clearing of indigenous people that were on the land and the soon after importation of African slaves to then build up that land. And the way in which they maintain that relationship, they being colonizers and slave masters and settlers was through violence. And they continue to do so in ways that might not be readily apparent as they were in you know, 1619, where they were in 1776, where they were in 1823, where they were in 1920, 1950, even up to the day. And I think the other concept that it's important for Fanon's work that also plays into Afro-Pessimism is this concept of Manichaeanism, or as I used to call it, Manichaeanism, which is just means an intense religious or philosophical dualism. Um, this concept actually develops in the third century AD in Persia. And it's really trying to talk about a, there's like a certain prim, primal conflict or as someone would call it an antagonism, right? Between light and darkness. And this idea of dualism, you see it in literature, you see it in media, you see it in video games, you see it in even how we talk about us and them dynamics, right? That there's a fundamental group that's good and that there's a fundamental group or a person or entity or concept of thought that's bad, right? And it's often depicted as those that are good, that are, they are light, they are pure, they are righteous. Those who are bad are dark, they are, you know, diseased, they are, you know, in some way pathological, right? So I think another way to think of this concept of Manichaeanism or the philosophical dualism is what is the representation of death? Like, what is the most common representation of death that you've seen in popular culture? Grim Reaper, I suppose. What does the Grim Reaper look like? Um, 
dude wearing like a hood with a scythe. What color is that hood? Black. There you go. And when we think of life, we think of like the traditional Christian, you know, and depictions of God, God or angels wearing white, you know, they're bathing in light. God creates life through, let there be light, right? So even in Genesis, the fundamental antagonism is that between blackness as a void and then the light that is produced by God that then provides the context for all creation. Not to say, you know, like I said, not trying to dig at my Christian folk here, but we're just using this as a sort of way to describe that particular concept. Um, I've done a lot of talking. So does anyone want to read this quote that just popped up in the lower left-hand corner? Um, the black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man, a black skin, white mask. So yeah, the black skin, white mask is the book that's like really important to Afro-pessimism because it's the one that talks a lot about ontology, the one that talks a lot about the psychological relationship and the sort of experiential or existential relationship between uh, black people and white people or colonizers, right? But this quote that Fanon that it says it's not really it's not trying to make a statement about like an inherent black incapability like black people can't do things in the face of white people, but rather about it's imposed right. There's something about blackness that is has no capacity to it, and the world that is structured by an anti-black solidarity that fails to appreciate the perceptions and understandings or sentience of those marked by racial blackness. And the reason why we use the term marked by racial blackness is because there was, you know, people lived in Africa. There were whole cultures, there are whole communities, there are whole social systems that predate the arrival of Europeans and of, you know, and of chattel slavery that just sort of just get washed and sort of erased to the wayside, right? Because of how those people ultimately considered who is considered and what is considered a member of humanity. This next lovely person who's unfortunately JPEG burned and stretched to death is Hortense Spillers. Her essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American grammar book, which was published in Diacritics in 1987, is really important to a lot of people's work, not just Afro-pessimists, very important to Black feminism and generally Black studies writ large. And we're just gonna summarize some, like Hortense Spillers is like one of the densest people in my mind to read. So we're gonna try to do our best to condense that and to the most digestible bits that are relevant for Afro-pessimism. So the first thing that Hortense Spillers does is make a distinction between the violence that happens upon the flesh and the violence that happens upon the body, right? Um, body, is different because it assumes that you have some sort of like coherence to it. Like you have a body is a like whole, and at least in the way that people want to conceptualize it, right? Even if you have individual fingers, nails, cells that make up, all that makes up your whole body, and that's the entity in which power, force, violence, and agency extend from. But for the slave, it's not about the body as much as it is the flesh for multiple reasons. One, at the very level of pigmentation, that becomes a way of marking difference for slave societies, especially cattle slavery, in addition to the ability to just independently, much like how you would do a cow if you were preparing it to butcher, you can literally isolate certain parts of the flesh as productive units, right? Because remember, slaves were objects, they were not people. So when they were evaluated, no one really cared by no one being the enslavers, no one really cared whether or not you were, you know, male, female that much, unless you could produce more slaves, more so it's like, what did your muscles look like? Did your skin shine the right way in order for you to see uh, appealable to a potential buyer, right? Um, do you have any marks? Do you have any brandings that indicate prior ownership, right? And those could be used to track, mark, and, you know, delegate certain representations to those bodies. The other thing that the flesh does, it allows you to think of the body as a micro figure, right? So when you're torturing somebody, you're like, oh, this slave ran away. So instead of, you know, killing them outright, maybe I'll just cut off a thumb, take a lobe of an ear, 
do have some way to do some type of violence to that flesh in order to, to A, reify or resustain the slave status and also cement my own power in the process. The other concept that's really important for Afro-pessimism as it relates to the work of Hortense J. Spillers is that there is a grammar or a system of rules that dictate how Black people, especially Black women, are able to articulate various aspects of their lives that are then represented in political, social, literary discourse in ways that are pathological and work to dispossess gender difference. And another thing that's important about Hortense Spillers' work that she was writing in the time where there was some tension between feminist studies and African-American Black studies where somebody was like, oh, you can only be really a feminist. And they're like, oh, we need to prioritize the issues of race and our conversations about how history, violence, power operates. And then there are people like Hortense Gates, those who are like, well, I do, I am a woman, I am Black. There are actually conflicts between Black men and Black women as there are with Black women and white women in the academic field. So when speaking about the distinctions between the way in which violence happens upon the flesh of Black men and Black women, and how that sort of manifests in a bunch of different power structures, the word that Spillers uses to describe that dynamic is I believe intramural, right? Because it's talking about conflicts within a given community versus conflicts that happen across different communities. And can someone read that quote that popped up on the screen for me, please? As a category of otherness, the captive body translates into a potential for pornotroping and embodies sheer physical powerlessness that slides into a more general powerlessness resonating through various centers of human and social meaning. That's uh, Mama's Baby, Papa's Baby, page 67. Yeah, so this is a return to that concept of pornotroping, right, and its relationship to rendering a certain body, certain being, certain entity powerless in the ways in which you can categorize them as other, as outside of a norm or a given community. And the ability to cast someone off in that particular form or manner helps center various types of social meaning and how we understand what constitutes a human. And next person we have is Sadia Hartman. She writes three particular publications that are helpful to the thought of Afro-pessimism. First one is Scenes of Subjection. Oh, I forgot, I was talking about it in a second. Scenes of Subjection, which was written in 1997. Position of the Unthought, which is an interview that she had with Frank Wilderson in 2003. Lose Your Mother, which is another book that she published in 2007, that sort of follows upon the themes of scenes of subjection and the position of the unthought, but it's not strictly Afro-pessimist in its interpretation, right? So some of these influences are not people who are who would call themselves Afro-pessimist. Hortense J. Spellers would definitely not call herself an Afro-pessimist, but understands that there's some value to the questions that are being posed by this school of thought. Scenes of subjection is really important to Wilderson's conceptualization of Afro-pessimism as that book it is that book where she develops the ideas of accumulation and fungibility as it relates to the legal, performative, and social construction of the slave. Uh, definitely covered that at the beginning when we talked about accumulation and fungibility. It just really means that the slaves were objects that could be used and subject to the complete and total authority of the master and not just the master, the law in especially antebellum slavery, which is what she's writing in the 18th century, the 19th century in which she's writing about, there were legal statutes that made it so that even if that slave wasn't, if even if a white, even if a slave encountered that white, a white person and that white person was not their owner, the slave still had to be subject to the will of that person who was considered a legal subject and a citizen in the eyes of the law, right? Very much in the same way, like if a dog is out in the street and a dog can't, you know, doesn't isn't in relationship to its owner, right? Um, 
it's not like the dog can go out and like, go to the bar have, have a whole life right it still is subject to the will of the humans around it that enable it to just exist in the world and be sort of recognized as like a dog not to say that our dogs are slaves but i think that's just sort of the easiest weirdly and weird analogy that we can sort of view for this particular audience because even analogies are called into question by way of afro pessimist thinking And she also critiques the political conception of struggle and resistance as formulated by Antonio Gramsci, um, primarily because she challenges the notion of consent and uses the trials of slaves that were subject to sexual assault, coercion, and rape as a demonstration as to how consent is not neatly as granted as one would think. And it troubles the idea of a lot of um, social contract theory that argues that there is an implied consent between citizens and the governments that represent them. And if the, if Iricide violates that form of consent, it means that, for example, the citizens can go ahead and revolt against their government and the government can in some way sort of like police and regulate its citizens in order to maintain its stability because those citizens agree to giving up or can they, those citizens consent in some ways to giving up certain rights for the protection of their community and their well-being. And the final reason why Hartman's work is important is because she really forwards the question in the beginning of her book of how can we evaluate the end of slavery in the introduction of the formerly enslaved into American civic and social life. The question that, we should, that she slightly poses is, did slavery really end with the conclusion of the Civil War? Or did it find ways to sort of morph its institutions, its relationships, its power, its performances in the wake of emancipation and reconstruction? Eventually she moves away from this argument, especially in her latest book, Wayward Lives. Um, and she's less concerned about whether or not is slavery still present versus like what are the after effects of that particular moment in history and how does it resonate with how the 20th century developed, at least the early 20th century developed. All right, and the last person that we cover, so no, we're kind of pushing on time here, is Orlando Patterson. Orlando Patterson's also really important and is also not an Afro pessimist. If you call, if you send an email to Orlando Patterson, he will definitely be like, I am not an Afro pessimist, no way, no how. But he wrote the definitive work on slavery and started to articulate an understanding of the slave, not as a worker, but an object dependent on what we call the three constituent elements of slavery. Natal alienation, which just means that a society or those in power do not have to recognize things like family relationship, kinship ties, right? You are natally alienated because natal refers to like familial from the world. In the context of slavery, like they were able to break up families because those were like cattle, like doesn't matter if the cow loves its mama, if the cow is going to be set to the uh, field house to be butchered, the cow is going to be butchered and the cow is just going to have to continue to roll around and figure that out until the owner finds some other use for that baby cow. General dishonor means that as your society doesn't recognize your capacity to have culture, your ability to submit agency, your ability to self-determine your self-determine yourself in relation to others in the larger community, right? You are dishonored from participating in social fields, in political arenas, in some capacity. And then the last one is gratuitous violence. And I think we covered that a little bit earlier when talking about flash body distinctions and just general talking about slavery. Slavery was not a contractual relationship. It's not like people signed contract to become slaves. Like, you were just taken from your home. You were put in poor conditions. You were beat if you didn't work. You were sold. No one cared. They're, they used you as they saw fit. So there was no reason for that violence to happen. And it already happened without constraint. And sometimes, it was, and sometimes especially in the context of antebellum slavery, it was excessive to the point of just not being reasonable. The other thing that Patterson start, sought to do was explain how social death was generalizable and 
non-racialized. It was just the condition of slave. Like it didn't matter if you were a slave in an ancient Roman, in ancient Rome, didn't matter if you were a slave in Greece, didn't matter if you were a slave in the in Persia, didn't matter if you were a slave in Africa, didn't matter where you were a slave, but this was just how it operates. And I think Patterson's argument is too that there's something about slavery that makes it integral to highly advanced industrialized, um, not even just industrialized, highly advanced societies, because there was slavery before we had factories or slavery after we had factories. It's just called human trafficking, right? So he's trying to understand how that phenomenon operates from ancient history into now. Um, and can someone read that quote that's in the lower right corner that's kind of cut off? That was for some reason. Uh, the worker who is fired remains a worker to be hired elsewhere. The slave who was freed was no longer a slave. Thus, it was necessary continually to repeat the original violent act of transforming free person into slave. Uh, that's slavery and social death. Thank you. I think that distinction is important, right? A worker or like the proletariat is fundamentally distinct from a slave because there is a need to repeat a particular type of violence to keep a, a person that would otherwise be considered free as a slave. Mm -hmm. So let's just outline some of the key concepts and ideas that animate Afro-pessimism and maybe watch one. I got ahead three clips, but I think we only really have time for one and talk about it a little bit. So first it critiques the idea of the human, right? That develops in the 16th and 17th century Europe that becomes the template that animates the cultural, philosophical, political, legal and social conflicts through today, right? So their argument is that humanity and this idea of humanity is not a given. Like there is not some sort of inherent understanding of what makes a person human, right? That is something that has been maintained socially, um, culturally, and also through the law in the way in which we define things like citizenship, property rights, familial structures, et cetera. Their argument is that the ability for those things to become coherent depend on the development and association with blackness to slaveness that happens at the start of the middle passage in the transatlantic slavery. Because there was a whole continent of people that were like, Asians, you're pretty much human because like, you know, China was a thing. We saw you, you have you had a bunch of advances that we recognize. India, y'all are kind of human. Uh, Persia, y'all are definitely human, even though we're not really sure how we feel about that whole Islam thing. Um, New World, we don't know what's over there, so it must be nothing. Um, Africa, what is in Africa? They're just Africans. They don't have culture, right? That was just sort of, even that's like a really condensed version of those conversations and sort of a hyperbolic version of those conversations. But ultimately, that's really what they communicated through the decisions they made to collectively sort of just extract resources, bodies, people, and fundamentally devastate the African continent in that particular time period and the effects of which we still see today. The other thing that's important for Afro-pessimism it argues that black suffering is distinct from other forms of suffering and cannot be analogized to other forms of political and social marginalization or oppression. These struggles of the worker, indigenous or Indian, feminist, queer, et cetera, whatever identitarian category or identity politic that you want to use to identify yourself in relation to institutions of power are ultimately parasitic on the suffering of the slave. And what this means is that, remember how we talked about earlier how Black people have an underprivileged but non-exclusive relationship to Blackness, right? Is that they will take that relationship and use it to say, oh, I'm just like you. My suffering is just like you, right? Which is distinct because what Wilderson argues is that the struggles of the worker, indigenous, feminist, and queer are struggles 
they are accomplished. They're not antagonistic because you can resolve all of those things. If the worker has protections, a stable wage, job security, the ability to provide for their family, they're good. Capitalism's conflict is over, which is why they argue that a communist you know, utopia is the, the end result of history and politics. Same indigenous people, it's a little bit trickier for him because he argues that depending on how they wanna relate or you know, identify their position in relation to civil society, it can either be, oh, we're trying to recover the loss of our land or recover the loss of our culture that happens with the encounter um, between Europe and the new world versus what he thinks is a more powerful analytic or more powerful positionality to take if you're really trying to disrupt civil society and its institutions and values is to be like, we come from a position of genocide, your policies are genocidal because you wanted to see some value in our land, but that fundamental process of clearing in of in itself is unethical to its core. And it proves that nothing that you've ever cultivated or grown on this land is worth saving. Feminist, same thing, patriarchy, if we get rid of patriarchy, the conflicts that enable the formulation of feminist critique, socialization, socialization, et cetera, goes away and so on. But the reason why they want to have that conflict is because they see or they experience in some way through things like a little bit more economy, through affect, through feeling, encountering the sort of abject position of those who have been associated with blackness and slaveness and like, no, have no desire to do that, right? We won't be a slave to our bosses anymore. We won't be a slave to our husbands, et cetera. Like that particular rhetoric animates a very parasitic relationship on the suffering of the slave because we can always be like, at least we're not as downtrodden as those people who have like literally you've been like are those sort of weird empathetic conversations that happen across cultural distances or like where people are like oh i understand that your family was taken from africa oh i understand that jim crow and segregation happened and like that was a terrible thing but aren't you so glad that at least like we can come together as queer folk or we can come together as workers to you know have some sense of solidarity against you know these institutions of power right and that particular relationship is like, you're trying to instrumentalize that historical narrative for your own political purposes that don't necessarily guarantee, um, you know, relief for those that have had that attachment to slavery and through their blackness, right? And especially for things like uh, capitalism, right? It's not like there weren't communist governments or like communist states. Like we have Cuba, Cuba's still out there. There are still black people in Cuba who suffer distinctly than those who might be, you know, kicked out because their families were part of the bourgeoisie class back in like the 50s or 60s, or the people who are like still struggling with the sort of autocratic elements of that particular society now. The general argument that they make is that no matter where you go, if there is a group of people who ever are descended from the African diaspora or can be identified as black as some way, kind of way that their darkness is a place of negativity, then those associations, associations will be made. Then the next one is that slavery is not a historical event that ended in 1865, but it is a relational dynamic that animates excuse me, as well as captures the ways in which individuals and institutions work to maintain an anti-Black, make work to maintain anti-Black violence. And I think this idea of slavery as a relational dynamic, I think is a more powerful thing about Afro-pessimism because it uses it as a heuristic or analytic to understand how power operates and how it can sort of like change the different, and based on how you are positioned in a given society. So. Afro-pessimism is in some ways concerned about structure, but it is also concerned with paradigm, which is why it uses the term position, because paradigm just means worldview, right? Depending on where you are positioned in the world, your view of what operates, what matters, what is essential, what is important, what is consistent of a conflict or an antagonism depends on how you are oriented or where you are placed in the world. So 
position slavery understanding it as a relational dynamic allows us to talk about those different positions in ways that we might not otherwise be able to if we think of them as individual identities and identities or the effects of certain relationships between institutions and the individuals who break the rules or transgress the rules of those institutions as well. Oh, here it is. Let's see, I think I might, might have time in one extra few minutes. Let's go. Now, here it is. Okay, I just want to read these two pages for you real quick. And I'm pretty sure there's like one more part of this PowerPoint, but then we can transition to questions and answers. And I think these are supposed to be 70 minute lectures. So we might have a little, we have time for definitely one of the clips um, that I have prepared. So this quote comes from the book Afro-Pessimism by Frank Wilderson. And we'll be covering pages 227 to 288. Wilderson writes, quote, the three constituent elements of slavery, naked or gratuitous violence, general dishonor, and natal alienation make the temporal and spatial logic of the entity a character or persona in a narrative and of a setting untenable, impossible to conceive as in birth and or conceive of as in assume any coherence. Well, that's, yeah, if you, oh man, I hate using a year. This is mostly just an issue of having a year of using Google Meets and this is like the most zoom intensive thing ever, but you should be able to see it now. Can you see it now, Noah? All right. Um, we're here where it says the violence. The violence of slavery is not precipitated as a result of any transgression that can be turned into an event, which is why I've argued that this violence is gratuitous, not contingent. It's not based on whether or not you break a rule or something. The dishonor embodied by the slave is not a function of event either. His or her dishonor is general. It is best understood as abjection rather than degradation. The latter implies a transition. And since the slave is natively alienated, she is never an entity in the meta narrative genealogy. And so Afro pessimism is a theoretical lens that clarifies the irreconcilable difference between, on the one hand, the violence of capitalism, gender oppression, and white supremacy, such as the colonial utility of the Palestinian Nakaba or the Sand Creek Massacre, and on the other hand, the violence of anti-Blackness, the human necessity for violence against Black people. The antagonism between the post-colonial subject and the settler cannot and should not be analogized with the violence of social death. That is the violence of slavery, which did not end in 1865 for the simple reason that slavery did not end in 1865. Slavery is a relational dynamic, not an event, and certainly not a place in space like the self, just as colonialism is a relational dynamic, and that relational dynamic can continue to exist once the settler has left or ceded governmental power. And these two relations are secured by radically different structures of violence. Afro-pessimism offers an analytic lens that labors as a corrective 
to humanist assumptive logic. It provides a theoretical apparatus that allows Black people not to have to be burdened by the roots of an analogy, because analogy mystifies rather than clarifies Black suffering. Analogy mystifies Black people's relationship to other people of color. Afro-pessimism labors to throw this mystification into relief without fear of the faults and fissures that are revealed in the process. Oh, that's just All right, no. Can y'all see the slide again? I can't ever see myself in this. Uh, hello? Did you say my name? Yeah, I, I was saying if anyone could see the slide because I had to switch to another screen. Can y'all yeah, see, we can see it? Okay. All right. And so, yeah, this image I think hope illustrates that sort of idea that slavery is a relational dynamic, right? Because if you think about the, the concept of the asymptote that we talked about earlier, that it is a curvature, right? It's not like a flat line that indicates progress, right? And it can ultimately potentially loop around in ways that might not be readily apparent upon first glance. And the last thing that's important is this idea of conflict versus antagonism, right? Each of those isms that we talked about earlier, capitalism, patriarchy, heteronormativity, uh, colonialism, et cetera, they all argue that there's an essential antagonism at the heart of the world. For, cap, for Marxists, it's the antagonism between the boss and the worker. For colonialism, it's the antagonism between the colonizer and the colonized. Feminism, the patriarch and femininity, women, women, et cetera, et cetera, right? But what Wilderson argues is that not all of those, that we, those antagonisms are truly antagonistic because there's in some ways we can resolve those conflicts through either social or political rearrangements of our current order. If we are taking for non, and if we rely um, on this concept of Manichaeism or Manichaeism, right, we can see that there is some fundamental antagonism, right, that motivates how worldviews are formed and how institutions are formed and how we like understand and relate to one another. For well, this then, that is the antagonism between the human and the slave, the black and the non-black. He says that no matter, even in all those sub-isms, right, that antagonism is going to be at the root of the various conflicts that animate those other schools of thought. Okay, so we got to really wrap this up. So, and I think we can just take a couple of questions, try to look at one of these Marvel clips, and then we got to gotta call it a wrap. So like, no, Neon asked the question, would Moten and Harney be considered Afro-pessimists? I would not call them, like, they were not, they like they won't have the rep or the badge of Afro pessimism, but the things that they do say do say about institutions, the ways they do talk about certain types of relationality between like the general conspiracy who can be considered a conspirator, what does it mean to have some relationship to blackness, do resonate with Afro pessimism on some levels, but Moten and Harney are not Afro pessimists. Yeah, any other questions before I play this clip as a food for thought moment and then we have a brief reflection and then we close out. Um, on the idea of conflict versus antagonism, is this that like 
you're very, you're kind of hard to hear. Your audio is kind of hard to hear. Yeah, sorry. Um, on the idea of conflict versus antagonism, is it that all conflicts argue that they are there is an antagonism, but then Wilder Wilderson's like they aren't actually like conflicts since they can be solved with like a change in society. Actually, yeah, I think that's like if that's what you interpret it as, I think that's actually a really sort of concise. Um, okay, yeah, I, I was just kind of confused that. on like, I guess, my own understanding of it. Yeah, that's totally fine. This is a lot of work, and a lot of people did a lot of time in order to do that. Okay, yeah, thank you. Hey, Ken, I was just messaging you if you yeah, need Yeah, I, me. I oh. literally just did it. I'm the host now? Yeah, yeah, you should be. No, I'm not. I think Jonah's the host now. Oh, well, that's because you both have a J, and that was really confusing. Jonah, can you make me the host? Sorry about your noise. Yeah, I just did. Thank you.